Please welcome Christina Terplin and Paul Nick Hinton of the international law firm of Clyde & Company LLP as they discuss the basic risks and best practices for information security and privacy and provide an overview of the issues unique to the state of Montana. Christine is admitted to practice in California and before the United States Patent and Trademarks Office. She is a 2003 graduate of the University of California Hastings College of Law with a JD where she founding member of the Hastings Race and Poverty Law Journal and a graduate with honors of the University of California, Davis, with a Bachelor of Science degree in 2000. Christina serves on the board of directors of the General Associates <coughs> Advocacy Project. Paul is admitted to practice in California and is a graduate of 2007 of the Boston University School of Law with a JD, where he serves as the legislative drafter of the Massachusetts State Senate. Paul is also a 2004 graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, where he received a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. Please welcome Paul and Christina. Well, uh, thank you so much for having us. We're, we're very excited to be here today, and I uh, hope to put on a really good presentation, kind of uh, give you guys a broad overlay of the land here in terms of privacy and, and data breach risks. Uh, it's, it's very much an evolving area of, of, of risk and of the law, and things kind of change day to day. Um, so we hope to give you a good kind of groundwork for, for you to take back with you to your respective agencies. And um, Christina will kind of uh, get us started from there. All right. Well, first, we have our, our nice legal statement. <laughs> yes. Uh, be because we are lawyers, we always have to do a little bit of CYA. So uh, there's a nice little disclaimer on there. It's uh, basically just you know our, our respective opinions here. Uh, not to be construed as, as those of Clyde & Co. or clients. So uh, with, with that out of the way, a um, little bit on, on who we are, who the firm is, and kind of uh, give you a bit of background on us. So Clyde & Co. is a, it's a global law firm. We are now over 1,400 lawyers all over the world, um, 30 offices on six continents. We're a full service firm. Uh, Paul and I happen to work on the data protection and privacy side of things and also on technology errors and emissions insurance. So in that role, um, we provide risk management advice, and we also work on handling breach and cyber claims for insurance carriers. In particular, we work very closely with Beasley, who is the cyber and privacy insurer for the state of Montana. So in that role, we have had the opportunity to work with some of your team on some small incidents. Luckily, they've all been small so far, but that's yeah. how we have a relationship the with of, you. The state of Montana definitely has a great track record with, as far as Beasley's concerned, all of the, the, the incidents have been very small and minor, but it's, it's kind of how the relationship has been built, and that's, that's why we're here. And we'll do an overview now. This is what we are going to be speaking about. Um, first, we're going to talk about the risk of information in the digital age. Then we'll go into personal information. What is it um, legally? speaking and why is it important to all of us then we'll talk about breaches of personal information what really is a data breach and how do they occur then this will be the fun part the wall of shame we get to embarrass various um, governmental entities on the data breaches they've had uh, sources of liability we'll talk about the most common sources of breaches i think that'll be interesting to you in particular uh, how to respond appropriately to an incident and then risk management and breach prevention. So best practices, and even if you do have those best practices and you have a breach, what to do in order to try to <coughs> mitigate that loss ultimately. At the end, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please hold them at the end and then we'll get to them at that point. Great, great. So uh, let's get started with a real quick overview of, of the cyber risk. Now, when we're talking about risk in this area, what we're really talking about is the risk of the theft, the loss, or the unauthorized disclosure of personally identifiable information or protected health information. Those are sort of two sides of the same coin. What we're really talking about is personal information capable of identifying someone. Now we'll get into the specific terms and what they mean, protected health information versus personally identifiable information. We'll talk about all that in a bit, but essentially we're just talking about very generally any information that can identify an individual. Um, so, you know, we, we give these talks quite often and, and I think in, in terms of state and local government agencies, there's a, a perception that this is not a problem that's really pertinent to you. Um, most folks, when they think of data security, privacy, they're thinking of financial institutions, 
uh, anybody that holds credit card numbers, social security numbers, things of that nature. But the reality, and particularly when we get to the wall of shame, you know, the reality that's, that's borne out in, in kind of how some of these incidents have happened is a state and local government agencies are, are very vulnerable for a variety of reasons. Um, one is the perception that they're not vulnerable. The, the, the folks that are after this type of information, the, the cyber criminals that are out there, have figured out that um, you know, the B of A's of the world or, or the Sony's of the world uh, spend a ton of money to deal with this type of stuff. And even those uh, entities still get regularly hacked, breached, compromised. Um, so it, it has kind of now moved to, to an era, we've moved to an era where uh, these, these bad guys are now figuring out that it might be easier to focus on data centers of sources of information uh, that are not necessarily tied to financial transactions specifically, but can get them started on that process. And what we see with, with state and local government agencies is a lot of information on the books, a lot of information being held on residents, on employees, on contractors. The information can go back far longer than what we would otherwise see maybe in the private sector. So there's, there's a lot of information on the books, and that's always going to be a tempting target. Um, there's also, as, as with private enterprise and everywhere else, there's an increasing move towards portable computing devices. Um, the Blackberries, the laptops, the thumb drives are all immensely helpful. They're very valuable, but they are a huge source of risk. Um, you know, as, as we'll get to later today, the number one uh, source of all these incidents is just simple employee negligence. Folks forgetting to leave things or forgetting to take things with them, leaving Blackberries, uh, handheld devices on a train, on, in a car, or somewhere like that. So, as more and more of your of your you know your employees, folks you work with, are, are moving towards working with a portable computing device, this is particularly a, a more important issue. Um, you know, and then kind of harping on what I, what I just said, there's there's sort of the perception that this isn't a, a public entity problem. This is more of a private enterprise problem, which is very much not the case. And 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 there's a, really a longer history of, of dealing with these issues in the private sector, specifically with financial institutions. So a lot of times there's, there's different learning curves for state and public agencies, and, and the goal is you know, that after this presentation you have a better sense of, of how to get started in that process. And you know, I know from, from uh, working with, uh, with uh, folks at the Montana State Government on a regular basis now that you guys are very well prepared, and, and this is just kind of to give you a bit more perception in that space. So the, uh, the, the number one source of all our, our problems here is, is identity theft. Um, there is a big, large, sophisticated market for identity theft. Um, you know, if you kind of look at the studies and the numbers, the, the Bureau of Justice and Statistics has some good numbers on folks that have actually experienced identity theft. And experienced is a misleading term. Uh, you know, that really means uh, found out about the identity theft. The majority of identity theft that goes on in, in this country is not experienced by the subject for quite some time. So what you'll see is you know, around 2005, you have about 5.5% of US households, you know, about 6.4 million households that have one member, 12 or older, experience identity theft. Um, that's a very uh, probably understated number because in reality, a lot more folks are, are being targeted, have had their information compromised, they're just not aware of it yet. Um, and in 2005, this area is not one that's getting a lot of media attention. There's not a lot of law enforcement action going around it. it it's pretty much under the radar. By 2010, have a lot more media attention, a lot larger breaches that have been publicly disclosed because there are now sort of a variety of state and federal laws that require that type of disclosure. Um, there's more media attention, there's more law enforcement attention. Individuals are more attuned to this type of stuff, but the numbers keep rising. And so we get from 5.5% to 7% by 2010. Again, just of individuals that have you know, affirmatively experienced identity theft, uh, have had it, uh, have discovered it, essentially. Um, so the numbers keep growing. And uh, if you look, kind of, there's some great studies by a, a firm called RSA in conjunction with the FBI about the black market for identity theft. And it's, it's actually really surprising when you look at the numbers um, how cheap this stuff is. I mean, you can get full credit card file, uh, $1, $1.5 to $3 per file. A social security number, $1 to $6, depending on whether it comes with a name and uh, a mother's maiden name. Um, so 
it, it, it's surprisingly cheap. You would think that this stuff would go for a lot more money, but it, it's really an issue of basic economics. There's a lot more supply than demand. Uh, there's a lot of this information floating around. Um, it's very easy to acquire. Um, you know, probably uh, the the social security number thing will will go up and down depending on the characteristics of the social security number. So uh, maybe my social security number, or Christina's social security number, isn't as valuable as a recently deceased person's social security number, child's social security number, folks that would not discover any kind of identity theft for some time. But even then, you know, the numbers are very low. Um, and, and it's very easy if you sort of kind of get your feet wet in this, in this black market to acquire the tools you need to um, go into business for yourself and, and start uh, giving it a go, start trying to uh, take some of this information. And you know, if you, you have a, a year or two of uh, basic programming under your belt and uh, some money, you, you can get into the, uh, the, the hacking uh, game yourself. You know, one to $2,000 for a basic Spy Eye Trojan kit. Um, good holiday gift for the aspiring, <laughs> for the aspiring hacker, and, um, and you're ready to go. So it, it, this is not something, you know, there are definitely uh, sort of these big, massive state-sanctioned, um, we think state-sanctioned hacking ranks that are run from China and the Eastern Europe, but the reality is that, that most of the incidents are, you know, some kid uh, fooling around in, in their mom's basement. And uh, they're very easily uh, capable of acquiring what they need to, to get started, and they have a lot of time. And so, you know, you guys are on the job eight hours a day, but they might be on the job 20 hours a day, 16 hours a day, so on and so on. So that's really the market. That's, that's kind of the end result of all this stuff, is the information is acquired, it's put up for sale, and, and then uh, folks are gonna try to do their best to steal someone's identity with that information. So next, we were going to tell you about the general categories of personal information. So as Paul said before, there is protected health information and personally identifiable information. Protected health information is pretty much what it sounds like. It is health information um, related to an individual. So information on your treatment, your health condition, even your payment for health care services. That would all be protected health information that's subject to federal regulation. Um, and it's interesting because it really, we've had incidents where it's been literally like credit card receipts, but it showed that they paid their copay at a facility. That could still be protected health information. Um, personally identifiable information is the flip side of that coin, and it's information capable of uniquely identifying an individual. That is the stuff that's subject to state law and lovely United States. Most of the states have diff varying definitions, but as a general rule, we could say that it's name plus one non-public identifier. So your social security number, driver's license number, date of birth, or a fin financial account information. That's a general rule of thumb. Um, but I do want to distinguish, that's, that's the legal definition under the breach notice laws. When we talk about whether or not information can actually identify you, because what we see is a lot of companies or entities will um, decouple information. So they'll say, I took the name off of all that information, so it's not personal information. I can't identify you anymore, or anyone anymore. And there was a, real, there was a study, um, 1997, so it's a little old now, but what's interesting is what they found was that even without someone's name, if you use other types of information, you could uniquely identify most Americans. So 87% of US citizens, that's 216 million out of 248 million, um, were able to be uniquely identified just based on their zip code, gender, and date of birth. And 53% of the population can be uniquely identified by only the place that they live, so the city or town, their gender, and date of birth. So uh, the lesson there is that thinking that if you, you anonymize data by just removing their name and then the information, you can do whatever you want with it, it's probably not the case. And if, if you use any of that type of information statistically for research purposes, you should really think about how you're de-identifying it, how you're decoupling it. But um, you know, in terms of personal information, specifically um, under Montana law, what, the way things work is, as Christina said, we have, you know, of the 50 states in the union, the 46 uh, that have a data breach notification law, each have their own separate 
definition of personal information. Um, in Montana, here it's, it's, it's first, first name and, and last name, or first initial and last name, um, of an individual in combination with one or more of the following data elements where those data elements are not encrypted. And uh, it's kind of what you would expect, a social security number, tax ID number, driver's license number, state identification number, whether that be for a Montana resident or for anyone um, you know, across, across the US. Um, and account numbers, credit card, debit card numbers, anything uh, with the corresponding security codes. So uh, for credit card, it'd probably be you know, the number in the front and then the CVV code, three digit code in the back. That would be a good example of the associated code. Um, personal information under Montana law does not include anything that's publicly available. So if you're dealing with real estate records, things of that nature, things that are in the public registry, not as much of a concern um, in terms of the breach notification laws. Uh, but maybe an issue elsewhere, as, as Christina mentioned. Um, so that is sort of the general conception of personal information. Uh, Montana, like most states across the U.S., has a, a different statutory scheme for public versus private entities, but the, the definition of personal information is, is fundamentally the same. So um, if you, you know, if your agency works with any of these data elements in particular, whether they be from employees, contractors, anyone, um, you know, it's, it's really something to, to think about, so. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's like even your HR files, because that's what we see when you talk, when we speak with a company um, or an agency, they'll say, well, we don't collect that information. And we say, well, what information do you have on your employees? And, oh yeah, well, of course we have that information because we need to have a social security number in order to show that we can employ them. And they have, you, you, lots of in agencies, I think, that don't think that they have this information actually do. Yeah, workers' comp claims, you know, anything of that nature can definitely trigger some of this stuff, both on the healthcare side. You know, you wouldn't think that maybe your agency has no conceivable relation to healthcare, but you have some folks who are filing workers' comp claims, you might have now a conceivable connection to healthcare information. Um, so moving forward. So what is a data breach? Um, as a, this is my lawyer side coming out now. I, I, data breach, is a, it's a term of art, and it really is like a legal term of art, I think. I know the IT people might have their own definition and thought of what a data breach is, but as a lawyer, it, it, I, we tie a data, the term data breach to statutes and obligations and reporting obligations under the various laws. So we like to call suspected data breaches or incidents I always cringe it's, it's, when a notice comes in and say, you know, data breach, and right there it's an admission right there that you have breached data. Um, and um, it's, so it's only an incident until we know for sure it's a data breach. That, that, so. it, that actual personal data has been breached. And I think that's something that's always good practices is not to necessarily automatically um, call something a data breach. Like a denial of service attack is not necessarily a data breach. Um, would be a great example. Right, 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 right. Um, but it's a term of art, and the definition, of course, again, depends on the applicable state and federal laws. I think that's the beauty of it, is that certain states will have a risk of harm trigger. So it's not really a per se data breach requiring any type of reporting or notification requirements unless there's the um, potential that the individuals whose information was impacted, would, that they could be harmed in some way reputational harm, they could have their identity stolen. Um, so an example of that would be a laptop that's stolen, it's encrypted, but, so you never get it back, but it's encrypted. That's no risk of harm, there's usually a safe harbor under most of the states, so that's not a data breach per se under the law. Um, same thing as if a laptop gets taken, stolen, miraculously you recover it, that's pretty rare, but you recover it and you're able to show it wasn't accessed or ever open. Once that's not a data breach. Um, and the data breach laws, as Paul had said before, 46 states have their own laws, DC, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. Um, and the relevant law is the state where the individual whose information was impacted, where that individual resides at that time. So people now are transient, so you could have information from 10 years ago and people that were only in Montana, but then they moved. So if you have an incident, it could be, you have some California residents sprinkled in there, Col people from Colorado. It doesn't matter where they were when you got the information, it matters where they are now when, when an incident took place. 
Um, it's also a way, um, we have federal laws, not that many. We'll see if that changes sometime in the future. But right now we have the HIPAA high tech law, which uh, deals with the healthcare industry and the protected health information that I was talking about before, as well as FERPA, which um, deals with student records. So if you are a university and receive any type of federal funds, you are gonna be subject to FERPA as well. Um, there's also, we're starting to see more countries outside the United States start to implement these type of laws. In particular, there's a couple of provinces in Canada that have breach notification laws as well as Mexico. Now, in, in Montana, I am, the Montana statute is, is, as far as these statutes go, is relatively older. Uh, first statute on the books is in California in 2003. Montana sort of starts to lay the groundwork in 2005. Um, and, and what a data breach is in Montana, it's, it's the unauthorized acquisition of computerized data, so, so not necessarily paper, although there are other laws that may cover that. FERPA would apply to paper, HIPAA high tech would apply to paper, but in Montana, we're talking about computerized data that materially compromises the security, confidentiality, integrity of personal information maintained by a state agency or anyone that works for a state agency, any third party, um, that causes or is reasonably believed to cause injury and the key again is to a person, doesn't say anything about a Montana resident, it's to anyone. Um, that's really the, the sort of capsule definition of what a data breach is. And Montana is in the minority of states across the US that has a risk of harm trigger. Um, other states, as Christina mentioned, if there's an incident, whether it's a, whatever it is, you're gonna report it one way or another. But uh, in Montana, you do have a, a risk of harm component, which is, um, um, I think, good, it, it, it allows for a bit of more reasonable response, you know, just because uh, someone lost a laptop and it has all this information on it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any reasonable conception of harm, there's any reasonable basis for harm. Now, what that risk of harm trigger or threshold is, is frankly kind of a mystery. Um, you know, in other states, there's been uh, attorney general guidance. A breach will happen, someone will or won't report it. The attorney general finds out and they launch an investigation and the attorney general says, well, I don't think that was reasonable. Uh, I think that was, you, you know, there was a risk of harm to the consumer, the, the citizen there. Um, that has yet to really occur in Montana, but it, it will. Um, and we'll get a bit more guidance on what risk of harm means. Uh, for the moment, the way most of the analysis goes is we kind of look to other laws that have a risk of harm component like HIPAA high tech and we kind of see what situations would, would entail a risk of harm trigger there and try to sort of um, analogize to what we have under Montana law. So uh, the idea though, organizationally, what we really always try to prioritize is you wanna leave that decision up to you know, whoever is in risk management or, or legal or whoever is the, the designated privacy person for the unit, the agency, whoever. You know, at the baseline, the, the sort of the goal is to figure out what happened, figure out what type of information is involved, and escalate that information up accordingly. You know, sometimes folks will, in, in a large organization with many different uh, heads and hands, one person will discover the breach, they'll say to themselves, I don't think there's much risk of harm here, and the breach kind of gets shuffled to the, the side. And then it turns out that there is a, a lot of harm and, and folks are affected. So you want to kind of uh, prioritize the reporting and not think so much about risk of harm. Um, that's, that's the last decision that you'll need to make before the breach is either publicized or kind of forgotten. So the question I think um, is how do these breaches occur? And um, you know, we have a bunch of bullet points here with a bunch of different examples. Um, you know, I think the employee losing an encrypted or portable device has really become uh, the most media talked about uh, uh, situation out there because it's just, so, it's just so easy to report on. And some of the largest fines and regulatory investigations nationally that have, have come out from data breaches have come out from an employee leaving something um, in a car, in a train, somewhere. Um, so, you know, the, the loss of an unencrypted portable device it's definitely one uh, factor that we see quite often. It's, it's pretty common, happens all the time. Uh, property crimes, very common. Um, you know, if you have a bunch of hardware on your property, uh, it's a tempting target. Obviously the people that want it could care less usually about what type of information is on it. 
They just want it for the, the physical value, uh, but that's not really going to matter. So if you have a server hard drive somewhere sitting in your office, it gets broken into, someone steals that, you have uh, you know, an incident now that could definitely implicate these breach reporting laws, depending on what type of information was on that device. Yeah, and property crimes are odd, because we've seen some where there are things that you would never think people would steal, like x-rays. And they melt, they found out, they melt them down, and yeah. they get the silver lining. Silver lining from them. I mean, so you have huge old backup devices that no Main one frames. wanted. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, they get stolen. It's ridiculous the type of stuff that actually gets stolen. Uh, the inside jobs are you know a little sexier to talk about. Not at, not quite as definitely not as common as the first two, but we def we do see. Um, employees steal information um, more likely, I mean, more often than I personally feel comfortable with. It's actually quite shocking. Um, and um, oftentimes, not surprisingly, when there's been layoffs, if they, someone's just been terminated and their access rights haven't been completely restricted right away, um, we, we do see quite a few inside jobs where they are taking information. It's not even necessarily to commit identity theft, I mean, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's just to um, get back. Revenge. Revenge at, the, um, at their employer. Um, so they either take information and just dump it in a public place because they know that's going to create havoc for everyone, or they post it, or, um, or they use it and try to commit ID theft. I think using it to commit ID theft is more sophisticated, um, and you're more likely to get caught. So you don't see that as often as opposed to just the pure revenge component. Um, stray faxes and emails. It would, it, you know, people all the time attach the wrong document or attachment to an email and send it. Or they send something with the right attachment, then you, but you get the autofill on the email line, on the Outlook two line. Outlook the source <laughs> of many, many breaches. And they sent something to the wrong phone. person. Um, stray faxes, not as common anymore, just because people aren't using faxes as much. But you do see, you know, they faxed a medical bill to the deli instead of the patient, you know, just a pure mistake. Right, and then phishing scams. So phishing scams have been around for almost as long as email has been around. Um, you know, the, the typical phishing scam is, is the Nigerian prince who contacts you to let you know that he just inherited a fortune, uh, but he needs $1,000 to get that fortune out of Nigeria. And if you just send him a $1,000 check, he'll send you 50% of the fortune. It sounds really stupid, and, and you would be surprised by how many people fall hook, line, and sinker for that type of stuff, maybe not necessarily the Nigerian prince anymore. Um, uh, but the more powerful and sophisticated version of, of phishing is spear phishing, targeted phishing, which is really uh, a sort of uh, behavioral engineering, or social engineering. So if, uh, if you have a Facebook page or you know, a personal website of some kind or something that I can aggregate information about you on, I'm going to make a little profile on you and I'm going to try to tailor my phishing email to sound as legitimate as possible. You know, if I know you work with someone named John, maybe I'll, I'll send you an email, hey, this is John from my personal account. I couldn't log into my work account. Can you send me X, Y, Z? Um, and people fall for that all the time, all the time. The phishing emails, the spear phishing emails have gotten really good. They're, they look very sophisticated, whether they're coming from you know, someone's personal email address or they're coming from an entity. You know, it's not very hard to go on the entity site steal the JPEG, kind of figure out what it looks like, what the communications look like, and especially if you have new employees, maybe they're not really, they don't know everyone in the organization quite yet, you send them out an email like that, uh, folks will fall for it. And the idea is with spear phishing, spear phishing is to escalate up the ladder and get to hopefully the administrator's login rights. You want to work your way up and get total control of the system and then lock people out and go from there. Um, so spear phishing, very common. You know, if, if you're seeing unusual emails, that's usually the first, uh, the first, um, first sign. Um, so the other component is malware, virus attacks. You know, as we, we saw earlier, it's pretty easy to acquire some malware and, and, and try to deploy it on someone's system. Um, you know, if you have good antivirus running, that'll usually take care of it, but not always. Um, advanced persistent threats, which are these really coordinated uh, movements, sophisticated, timely, and, and, and long um, attacks on a system on multiple angles, usually thought to be state-sponsored. You know, there's kind of this 
perception, or maybe accurate, maybe not, that uh, lots of arms of the, the Chinese government uh, sponsor uh, sort of you know uh, um, espionage essentially to try to acquire secrets, you know, any kind of trade secrets, anything of value, and um, that's definitely something that we don't see as often, but some of the most high profile, biggest breaches um, that have happened in the past two or three years have some kind of advanced persistent threat connection. Um, also very common is just a failure to, to scrub, to purge devices. Um, I think a great example a couple of years ago was um, a, a state entity in, in Utah sold a bunch of used computers, um, sold them on eBay of all places. Uh, someone bought them and um, mm -hmm. though the computers were deleted, someone had deleted all the information on there, it did not take long to recreate that information. Mm -hmm. um, there were bank records, social security numbers, all kinds of good stuff. So how you purge those devices and what you do with them when they're scheduled for destruction is, is pretty important. Um, and then the cloud. You know, as folks now are moving more of their information onto the cloud, um, you, know, you are really sort of um, ceding your control and risk in terms of security to someone else. And it becomes very crucial to really think about who you're contracting with, what their controls look like, uh, because you are really in their hands at that point. Um, so these are sort of the, the, the variables, the different types of breaches that can occur. Any thought maybe in the room on what's the most common um, source? What's, what's responsible for the most breached records? Emails. Emails. It's a good one. Anybody else? Facebook. Facebook. Always stay away from the Facebook. <laughs> I, I avoid that stuff. And surprisingly, it's, it's kind of not. Um, the most, the biggest source of records lost are portable devices. Huge. And, and unintended disclosure, the stray emails, also up there. Loss of physical records, very big too. So those three things, if you'll see, out of the 94 uh, million records compromised in this three-year period, those top three are really responsible for the, the, the vast majority, the lion's share of all that. Um, so you know, if you kind of take away anything from this presentation, it's that these three things are usually going to be the, the main source of your problems. And I think what we're seeing with the portable devices is that there's just been a big, in the last five years, people have viewed, port, viewed portable devices in a different way. Before, it was a means to work from a different remote location. And now you're seeing more as storage devices. So if people have Blackberries or iPhones, they don't want to purge all their old emails because they want to be able to search them up and find either that old email address or find the email from three months ago. They want to have that search function. So it becomes like a storage device where you know, five years ago, you didn't even have that memory capacity on that portable device to be able to do that. Same thing with laptops. We'll see multiple, dealt with multiple situations where um, the, the employer has a rule that you cannot download a certain number, anything above a certain number of records or any records onto a laptop, but the, someone wants to be able to work when they're on vacation, they have to catch up, they want to be able to work from home, so they do a mass download in violation of rules know, hundreds of thousands or millions of records, and now that capacity is available on laptops, so you can just download so much stuff, um, and it's, it's really dangerous, because it, you lose them or they get stolen a lot. Yeah, yeah, I think thumb drives also definitely fall in that category. Yeah, and thumb yeah. drives now, you can put a ton of records you on just thumb drive. I mean, that thing is so small, it's just so, so easy to lose one of those, and, um, you know. If you have, you allow folks in your organization to come in, even if you don't allow, sometimes people do it anyway, they have to catch up on a lot of stuff, they're going on vacation, they'll bring in a thumb drive, load some, some work on completely well-meaning employees just trying to get uh, a jump on, on the workload, but uh, can present a very, very serious risk. All right, so uh, let's talk about the wall of shame and uh, give you guys some examples of, of, how, of how these things happen and sort of, um, um, you know, we, we've kept them uh, public entity specific. There's uh, nothing from Montana. Nothing from <laughs> Fortunately, nothing to put on here, so it's 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 easy, easy. Um, uh, we did not focus on anything with with private enterprise. There have been in the past three years huge breaches, hundreds of millions of records um, in the private sector, but definitely some some good examples in the public sector as well. So, Christina will get us started. So, first, we'll start with the Department of Defense. Um, loss of computer backup tapes in the trunk of an employee's car. 
um, totally what ne no ill will by the employee, was just taking him to transport him to another location, parked herself in the car, um, parked him in the car, I think she went into a restaurant or something to that effect, and the car was broken into. Everything was wiped out of the car. It wasn't like they went in there just to get the backup tapes. They just stole whatever was um, portable from the car. Um, so it was a DOD contractor that did this. Um, 4.9 million active military personnel, veterans, and their families. Uh, one, yeah, we've got some <laughs> we got one in, in uh, the audience. So um, that's good. Uh, their records, medical records. Not, you know, not a very, it's very embarrassing event for the Department of Defense, um, and a very expensive event for the Department of Defense and their contractor. Uh, Congres congressional inquiry was came in to they investigated to because they wanted to know why in the world was this contractor using you know backup tapes that weren't encrypted and allowing someone to put them in the trunk of a car you know, a fairly reasonable inquiry but yeah they have now and I think what you'll see and multiple AG inquiries attorney general inquiries and what you see is that they will when you have a regulatory inquiry they don't just look at that incident they want to look at the whole pattern and practice and see, you know, are you taking sufficient protocols in making sure that A, you are protecting your information and your vendors are protecting information adequately. So they are gonna look at the history of your contracts, any other type of inc incidents you've had, whether or not they're publicly um, disclosed of violations and breaches. Um, so they are, are time consuming and they can be quite costly to try to produce that information. Um, in addition, there were at least 10 class action lawsuits that were filed against the Department of Defense and the contractor. They are still pending, um, and they are probably going to end up settling. I mean, that's what we end up seeing with the majority of class action lawsuits is that it's very difficult to get out on motion. So they end up settling, and the settlement costs, when you think of 4.9 million people to settle that it's going to cost millions of dollars no matter what. Because even if you do a dollar a head, that's almost $5 million right there. But no self-respecting plaintiff's attorney would settle for a dollar Five, a head. I know, you have to pay the plaintiff's that's, attorney's that's fees ridiculous. too, so. <laughs> um, so moving on, so we have uh, the good people of South Carolina who we'll, we'll pick on a little bit today. They've had a few high profile breaches in the past year or two. Um, this one just happened in October. Uh, one of these phishing attacks I mentioned earlier, new employee, really dumb email. Uh, much of this is still under investigation, so who knows. But what, what's come out so far is a really basic email from a, uh, from a IT manager asking her for her login information because he needed to run some, um, um, you know, he needed to run something on it. It's kind of the way the email sounded. Um, and she fell for it, provided the info. Um, this was probably about a year before the incident was actually discovered. Uh, for multiple reasons it, it wasn't, and you had about 3.6 million social security numbers, 387,000 uh, credit and debit card accounts compromised. Uh, a big deal in the, in the state of South Carolina, which has really um, reformulated how they think about all this stuff. Uh, they've, they've had some, some problems that have kind of hit them one, two in the past year, but this breach was very sizable, made the, you know, the, the national media. Um, folks have been experiencing actual identity fraud um, have had their social security numbers used to file fraudulent tax returns, all kinds of things. So um, has really put this on the radar there. Um, we in, in California are very much not immune to this type of stuff. We have it happen all the time. Um, mostly in these two examples, it's, it's really um, a mailing issue and, and a vendor issue and an encryption <laughs> issue. Um, so the Department of Child Services contracted with IBM and Iron Mountain. They wanted to do some disaster recovery simulation. So they basically sent their master backup tapes, unencrypted, um, sent them to uh, IBM's facility. IBM worked on them, no problem. FedExed them back, and they, they never made their way back to the department. Um, no one knows where they are. Um, we don't have a risk of harm component in California, but even if we did, this is probably gonna be a reportable breach even with a risk of harm component because there's so much information and it's so valuable that um, you would probably want to report something like this. Um, so uh, moving on, the, the Utah Department of Technology Services had a password that was um, conveniently password 01. <laughs> um, not exactly the most secure password in the world. Uh, a basic brute force attack with, uh, with you know, use of a really 
cursory algorithm, crack that pretty quickly. Um, 780,000 780, files on Utah residents, some very sensitive healthcare information on children, all disclosed, you know, that type of thing has a, a reputational impact that you can't really undo. It looks very mighty embarrassing and um, it, it, it's definitely an issue. Um, so again, with California, same kind of incident. I, I guess we should invest in some better uh, mailing or, or, or get a return receipt or something like that. Um, um, department sent some unencrypted microfiche to HP to work on. Um, HP worked on them, sent them back. Um, package was missing parts. It was damaged. Looked like someone had just kind of wanted to see what was in there, pulled out some microfiches, didn't know what they were, threw them out, put the package back. Um, but 701,000 individuals all require reporting, um, and as we'll talk about in a, in a little bit, that gets to be an expensive endeavor. Um, most people, when they're thinking about the risks, they're thinking about lawsuits and all that type of scary stuff, but first thing to think about is, well, we have to actually notify all these people, um, so that can get mighty costly. Um, moving on, again, I said we were gonna pick on South Carolina. Um, so they had two of these breaches, big high profile breaches in the past 18 months. This was one of the um, um, you know, unscrupulous employee examples where you had an individual that was just emailing information to his Yahoo mail account. So he would uh, he'd get on, he'd uh, take Medicaid numbers, Medicare numbers, which usually track to social security numbers, usually incorporate the social security number in the Medicaid, Medicare number. He'd copy those bad boys down and just email them to his <coughs> Yahoo account. And this went on for eight to 10 months he was actually only investigated because he was not getting along very well with his coworkers. They had made some complaints. Um, there was a sort of a, a employment action against him that necessitated some investigation. And uh, some folks at IT looked at his system and were like, my God, you know, he's been sending these emails to himself for uh, going on a, a year now. And um, was arrested, the FBI came, definitely a fraudulent intent, was not using, not taking this information for, uh, for no, apparent reason, he was very much looking to sell it on this uh, black market we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Talk about uh, Florida. Northwest Florida State College, um, we had malware that exploited security gaps and systems over a period of four months. Uh, 279,000 students were impacted and employees, including social security numbers, their direct deposit bank routing and account number information. I yeah. like that one too because that, the, the, the sort of the idea here was that the malware was introduced on campus by a student. Um, that's kind of the, the, what's suspected at least. Um, so it's not this mastermind criminal element somewhere far away, it was just a student. Whatever he wanted to do with the malware, no one's really sure, but uh, um, that's how it got into the environment. And you know the idea with all of these sort of, especially the more tech component breaches, not really the run-of-the-mill property crimes or anything like that, is five out of every six breaches. No one really discovers for quite a long period of time. There's there's a good Verizon report, um, kind of detailing how discovery happens and and what sounds the alarm bells for people. And and usually, you'll see most breaches are are just go on for a very long time before anyone finds out about them. They're not picked up quickly. Um, there's a lot of lag time. Yeah, no, I would say a lag time of months, if not a, up to a year, is not uncommon on a breach, which is really horrifying to all of, especially the IT people, if it's like a malware or something, or if it's an employee that was sending stuff over you know, to a personal account or taking information over a long period of time. I mean, it can be a very horrifying discovery. So we can move on a little bit and talk about the exposure, the costs. If, if one of these things happens, what's kind of, you know, what, what, what's the bad side? How, how much is this gonna cost? Um, and, and it's expensive. I, you know, and I think personally, the, um, these are what the, there's a, the Phenomenon Institute does a study every year of what the reported costs are for a breach. I, I happen to think that these are a little inflated, but we're going to go off. This is the, this is, this the, is the blue this chip is, yeah. industry standard uh, <laughs> sort of assessment of how. So don't costs don't go. shoot the messenger here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they uh, the 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 they say it's two hundred and fourteen dollars per compromised customer or client record. Um, so let me tell you what these costs can comprise of. It's if you have to hire. Well, first of all, 
external forensic time. So if you have to hire external forensics to help out, that can be very expensive. I think they also take into account internal like efforts. So if you're dedicating your IT department to trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Downtime, yeah, definitely. You I mean, if, you, if you have a denial of service attack and you're down for 10 days, 20 days, you know, that's, those costs are factored that's, in. That's something. part of it. So that whole investigation, legal fees, um, <laughs> you, know, you will have to hire a lawyer probably um, to figure out whether or not it's reportable in what states whether or not to report to any type of regulatory agencies. So many of the states require attorney generals to be um, notified if there's more than a certain number of people in their state that have been involved. Um, there's also the just pure cost to notify. So if you are going to have to notify the individuals, you have to get those letters printed out and you have to mail them. Yeah, oddly enough, you know, we we're talking about computerized data and we we're talking about you know, digital information, but for just about every state, if you're notifying people, you're notifying them by mail. Um, unless you have some type of affirmative consent from them that they're, they've consented to receive communications by email for the entire class of affected individuals, you're really gonna have to notify them by mail, but just you know, a good old, good old fashioned letter and, and that can get pretty costly, uh, especially if you have a lot of information on folks from five, 10, 15 years ago, um, you know, good chance that they've moved around and, and you're gonna have to figure out a way to contact them. Um, and you know you can hire vendors for those type of services. It's not going to be cheap um, because if you are just getting return mail, you're then going to have to really deal with substitute notice. You're going to have to provide notice on your website, um, in the media, and that's the last thing that anyone wants because you know you've just upped the exposure uh, tremendously that way. Yeah, no, the uh, the plaintiff's attorneys definitely troll for those public notices. So to the extent you can just do direct mailings, that 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 is um, preferable. And, um, and then also, oftentimes, if there's, a, if there's a social security number involved, if there is some type of um, financial information where they're afraid that they can actually do identity theft, it's becoming the norm to offer credit monitoring or some type of identity theft protection service. So you have to purchase that. And also, it makes the mailings more complex because there has to be an individualized code for each person. So it ends up usually involving that you're going to have to have a third-party vendor to do those mailings because trying to track that for even if it's over you know, a few hundred people can be a pain. Um, and then there's oftentimes call centers. So if people call, get this letter and they say, I want to find out more information about what happened, chances are that the organization doesn't have the capacity internally or want to deal with those phone calls quite frankly, so they'll hire a, a call center to be able to answer those calls um, and only deal with the escalated calls. The people who are really upset and really want to talk to a manager, you just get those few calls. So, um, and then also this institute study, they also take into account lost, lost business going forward, so reputational harm to the extent they can quantify that. That's part of that number as well. And then you have the lawsuits or regulatory claims afterwards that might result. So. Breaches, unfortunately, um, there are a group of plaintiffs' attorneys that really troll for these, and they like to file lawsuits um, as a result. So you'll see for evasion of privacy, negligence, you know, et cetera. Yeah, data breaches are, are something like the new asbestos. They're, they're just so tantalizing to plaintiffs' attorneys. Uh, part of that is if you have this notification effort, this required notification effort, you're gonna get you know, 100,000, 200,000, a million people that each have this letter, it each says the same thing. Um, it's, it's almost like a borderline admission, right? You've told them that this breach happened, you're sorry about it, but here's what happened, because that's what you're obligated to do under the law. Um, and it's, it's just like a really tempting target. It's so easy to aggregate a class of individuals, really easy to, to, to kind of figure out who was affected, because it's either made the papers or um, you'll get a call from people if you're a plaintiff's attorney. Um, hey, I got this letter, what does this mean? Um, so uh, the, the good, a good example is, is South Carolina. And to just give you guys an example of how, how quickly this all moves, uh, because these sort of uh, plaintiff's lawyers want to be the first to the courthouse. They want to be the first um, to bat. And so uh, the South Carolina Department of Revenue breach, the 3.6 million person breach, and the breach is discovered in October 10th. On October 10th, uh, the public's notified very quickly, actually, in 16 days, which as far as these things go is quick. And uh, about five days later, the first lawsuit's on the books. So uh, the plaintiff's attorneys here, and actually the, the, the particular plaintiff's attorney here is a former uh, South Carolina state senator. 
Um, so knows exactly who he's dealing with, knows the players, and, and figured uh, this would be a, a very quick, lucrative settlement. Um, so these things move fast. Once the investigation is public, once the breach is public, um, if it's of a sufficient size and if there's the right type of data elements, I mean, it, you can almost expect a lawsuit. It's, it's definitely going to happen. And I think same with a regulatory investigation. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I think the regulators are um, they're becoming more concerned with these type of incidents. And there are definitely certain states where if you have a, a breach involving their residents, you will get a, a short and polite letter asking for more information about the underlying incident. Um, and oftentimes also ask for not just in incident, but what type of practices do you have in place to prevent those incidents? So what is your, um, your information security policies? Are they in writing? Share those with us. Um, you know, how many people were impacted in our state? What are you doing to prevent this going forward? Um, I, I, I don't want to make it sound so scary that everyone's getting penalties. They're not. But they are, it's, it's a pain to deal with. And it's definitely scary. And we are seeing some penalties starting to be issued now in um, connection with these breaches. And it's, um, I think it's just a very, it's an area of concern for the government right now. They really are taking personal information yeah, it's a, seriously. It's a, it's a big focus. I mean, the, the idea of personal information um, in, in the United States is, is the product of the Federal Privacy Act of 1974. It's sort of, it, it's the, the first statute um, nationally uh, that, that talks about data privacy, personal information. So it's always been a government priority, but with the, the, the digital revolution and kind of how easy it is to lose vast amounts of data so quickly and how many folks are interested in that data, it's become a really big priority. And I think the other thing with regulatory investigations is it's not all about fines. Um, the regulators have the power to sort of force you to do certain things. Um, and if they look at your, your uh, information security policy and they say, well, we don't like that, that, and that, um, you should probably fix that. I mean, theoretically, you could ignore that. You could say, well, we're not going to do that. Uh, but Lord help you if then you have a second incident, which is not very, uh, that's not atypical. You know, you have one breach, and two years later, you have another breach. And Lord help you if, if you know, the, the state AG told you, well, you should do this, this, and this, and you, you didn't do that. Um, and whatever that you were instructed to do might have been very costly and very burdensome. And you might have just chosen as a, as, a, as a risk to just ignore it for the time being. But if it happens again, um, the, the state AG is not going to take that very kindly. Yeah. Great. So talk, move on a little bit about you know, responding to breaches and, and how that whole process goes. I, I think as a backdrop with all incidents, data breaches, the timing is the number one thing. Um, <laughs> the idea is to get a response out quickly, but not too quickly. You don't want to start notifying people before you actually know what's going on in full. And you don't want to sit on the information um, for as long as possible, you know, and then decide at the very last minute to disclose. Um, so proper um, breach response really starts with reporting, and reporting up throughout the organization. So um, you know, for the state of Montana, you, you, know, you guys have a very great system that I, I think most of you are aware about. If not, um, there's a really good system with RMTD about escalating breaches up the organization. You know, if you discover something, immediately notify risk management, tort defense, numbers on the slide there. Just give them a call, let, you know, lay out the incident. You might not know definitively what's happened. You might not even know that something occurred. But if you have a suspicion, it's always better to, to, to verbalize it and get it out there, have someone know about it, than to just sit on it. Um, there's, there's sort of a, a next step to that. You know, the immediate supervisor co completes a report of incident form. You can submit it at that URL right there. Um, what you don't want to do throughout the organization and throughout the timeline of the breach is start contacting folks until that decision has been made by, you know, whoever is making that decision. Um, you want to avoid that. A lot of times that happens with employees. You know, if you work very closely with folks and you know that their information was compromised, you want to give them a heads up, but the reality is that when one person in an organization knows, the news is going to spread very quickly. So you know, until the decision has been made, we need to notify these people. It's something that you folks keep under your hat and kind of um, you know coordinate with the people that you need to coordinate and avoid talking about that type of stuff with anyone who could be affected. 
particularly you know, if you're in a, in a smaller town, smaller community, you know these individuals, you know the person who's been compromised. It could be a little bit uh, challenging to withhold that type of stuff, but it can do a lot more harm than good in the long run. And then uh, something that we talked about earlier is you know, throughout this investigation, you're going to have a, a lot of exchanges, a lot of emails, a lot of correspondence. Um, to the extent that you can, you want to just avoid calling it a data breach. Just call it an incident. That's all you know so far. The reason is if you do get a lawsuit out of it, the first thing that this uh, enterprising plaintiff's attorney is going to do is going to, uh, if he gets to that point to discovery, he's going to request all the records in the investigation. And maybe you'll say, ah, we didn't know what, we didn't know what it was. We're not sure. But if there's a smoking gun email from the first of the month showing that you know an IT manager called this a data breach, even though we all realize that we're just throwing that term around and it's not specific, um, it, it, in court, in front of a jury, it's not going to look too good. Yeah, and the reason why it's important is because what you see in these lawsuits is they say that you should have notified us sooner. Right. We didn't start taking action, start protecting our identity until we got this letter, and you waited three weeks to notify us. Or one month to notify us. And what they usually say in defense is, well, we discovered the incident on day one, but we didn't know that information was actually impacted until, you know, week two. And then we notified you the following week. So we responded very quickly. But then you get the discovery and it says, oh wait, day one, you said it was a data breach. What do you mean you didn't know about until week two? So that's the whole, you just, you really don't want to characterize it that way. Because um, they're not privileged communications. The, the, the deal with breaches, timing-wise, in Montana is, is that there's no fixed timeline to notify. Uh, a lot of states have a specific amount of days. You, you know, in Florida, 45 days. You need to notify within 45 days. Um, now, that's a little misleading, even that, if you have that nice guidance of a firm number of days. Forty-five day standard under the law, but if you knew all the information that you needed to notify individuals by day 20, you should have notified by day 20. So um, it, it can be really challenging to figure out what's a reasonable time frame to respond. Um, in Montana, there, there's no set timeline. There's no 30, 45 day requirement. It's notification without unreasonable delay. Um, uh, what that means is also kind of plainly uh, somewhat of a mystery what unreasonable delay is. Um, it will be subject to a, a regulator's interpretation. Um, there are sort of uh, varieties of reasons you can delay the notification, like a law enforcement hold. So if you're dealing with any kind of information that um, you, know, you think uh, a law enforcement entity would be interested in investigating, whether that be the FBI, the Secret Service is actually very active in data breaches and th this whole space, and they uh, actually do the lion's share of the investigation for this type of stuff. Um, you can sometimes, if you have the contact with someone in a you know, local law enforcement agency, FBI field office, something like that, you can get a hold on the notification if they think there's a, if they think there's a criminal element to it. But you know, as we talked about earlier, most of these breaches are not, have nothing to do with a criminal element. They're simple employee negligence, something of that sort, and the FBI could care less about something like that, so you're not going to get a law enforcement hold. So really, notification becomes a time-sensitive process, and it's hard to figure out what that reasonable standard is. Um, and you kind of have to just, just wing it and hope that whoever is investigating it on the other side is going to agree with that. Um, and there's going to be a lot of things that need to be done in this time frame. And so when we talked about South Carolina earlier and they, they managed this notification in 16 days, I, I think that's pretty impressive given the amount of folks they needed to notify. Because um, what you're going to have to do first is internally figure out what's happened. Um, so you know, like we talked about, you would escalate it up through RMTD they would sort of escalate it along to the state's cyber liability carrier to Beasley, who would, you know, hopefully uh, we get counsel involved. Counsel would come in and kind of look at the incident. Do we need outside forensics? Maybe have to contract with them, have to get them to come in, take a look at whatever device has been compromised or the system. That can take a bit of time. Um, while this whole process is moving, we kind of, if, we, if we're starting to see that we're getting towards a notification, kind of have to lay the groundwork of what we're going to do when the letters drop. Um, so part of that is just handling the logistics of that whole process. And you know, mm, I know, uh, you know if we had an incident in our firm and it involved <laughs> 500 people, we probably can logistically handle the notification and the mailing. Um, so you got to kind of ask yourself, well, if you had an incident with 5,000 people, 
50,000 people, 500,000 people? Are you capable and equipped of dealing with the logistics that's going to go in that notification effort, getting the letters out, dealing with the calls, uh, providing for the credit monitoring, all that type of stuff? Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a lengthy process. And um, depending on how complex it is, you know, if there's a forensic element, it's definitely going to take a lot more time. From a cost perspective, you know, what's, what's most costly in all of these investigations usually is the forensic element. And depending on the size, if it's a bigger breach, notification is going to be very expensive. Uh, a 3.6 million person breach, just to get the letters out, you know, basically ends up being about a dollar a letter. Uh, you know, 44 cents for the stamp, plus uh, printing, mailing costs, all that type of stuff. It's expensive and it's time consuming. Um, so responding to these things is, is really a challenge, especially if you have a sort of a decentralized organization where folks are doing separate things and, and maybe not checking in with each other so well. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, there are fixed deadlines in other states too. That's, that's a concern. Um, by and large, as Christina mentioned earlier, the, the way these state laws work is if you are the resident of a current state that's not Montana, even though the breach happened in Montana, you're supposed to be notified under the law of that particular state. So if you move to Ohio, you move to Wyoming, you have to be notified under that particular law. Um, so you could have, and it happens quite often, a breach that involves 20, 30 states. X amount of states have a 30-day notification requirement, and Y amount of states have no fixed deadline. And then you kind of have to navigate that and figure out if you're going to do separate notifications for the folks that have the 30-day deadline and the folks that don't, or if you want to do it all in one foul swoop. And there's, there's pros and cons to both approaches, and um, all of this is very time sensitive, and um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a stress filled situation because people are trying to get this out as soon as possible. Um, and um, you know, it, it can definitely be a challenge to get it done in, in a two week time frame, a three week time frame. I think that's, that's pretty impressive if you can do that. Yeah, we just need to talk to the plaintiff's lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so you know, here's the fun part, the insurance talk. Um, so the good news is that you do that the state does have insurance coverage for this type of stuff um, you know as a initial point I want to say that breach prevention should be the focus not necessarily Definitely. just relying on the insurance there are you know big deductibles and um, so it's not like if there's a breach you have insurance coverage you don't pay for anything or it's an auto insurance policy all right great so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the the insurance coverage that the state of Montana has for, the, for these type of risks Christina is really going to go over the specifics and kind of the, the how to work with the policy and, and what the policy provides. And it is really good knowledge, good good idea to have. So if you have an incident, you know you know to prioritize it up because the carrier may you know yeah, pick up uh, the tab. So uh, Christina, part of the tab. No. <laughs> um, the uh, so Montana participates in a, a national cyber information security insurance program. So you are a member of a group of entities that have all joined together and bought an insurance policy through a, a, a syndicate at Lloyd's of London. The syndicate is Beasley, and in um, London fashion, the syndicates like to identify themselves by numbers. It's syndicate 623 and 2623. Don't worry about it. You don't need to remember them, but that's the, the policy is from um, Lloyd's of London, with, and Beasley is the branded name that you would oftentimes hear if you were to deal with the insurer. The policy, um, it tries to really be a full package policy, and because of that, it can be confusing on first read, especially if you're not a lawyer. So I'll try to do my best to walk you through it from a really big picture perspective and not use legal terms. Um, if I start using legal terms, raise your hand and I'll try to stop. Um, but what it does is it, well, it has different coverages, so different insuring agreements, and they, we, I'd like to break them down from the first party side, which are costs that you incur yourself to respond to something or investigate something, and then third party costs, which are really costs in response to a claim. So a claim being a lawsuit or a regulatory action. Um, and they are, um, each insuring agreement, I'll actually walk you through the insuring agreements. You have privacy notification costs, 
So what we, we're talking about what you do when you investigate and notify in response to a breach. That is an aspect of, that's an area of coverage under your policy. It is everything from the forensic to the lawyer, the legal fees, um, to the cost to actually notify the individuals, to provide credit monitoring um, if you need to do that. And then, um, depending or not, the call center, depending on the circumstances there. Um, so those are the, the notification costs, and that's on the first party coverage. The policy has $500,000 of that um, cover under the policy. That's an aggregate limit, so that's for the whole policy year. Um, and it's subject to a $100,000 retention or deductible in more common terms. So if you were to have a breach, the first $100,000 is on the um, state's dime. After that, the insurance picks up. Um, you also have, oh, and also on there is um, public relations coverage, $50,000 of PR cover. Um, so in the event that it gets out and you have to hire a public relations consultant, there is those type of fees will be covered as well. Um, you also have the third party coverages, or, um, which are the claims reside, um, resulting from that. So you have coverage for civil claims, so that's claims by just normal individuals, um, so the class actions that might get filed against the state, or even an individual action, so if someone just sues on their behalf, um, those could be the cir um, circumstances where it's just uh, disclosure of one individual's information and they write that demand letter and say, you disclosed something that was very embarrassing, STD status, something like that, and now the whole town is talking about me, you owe me $250,000. That's something that the policy would respond to. Once again, there is a retention, a separate deductible for that. So if you have a breach and then you have a claim resulting out of that breach, you actually have two deductibles, so a total of $200,000 that would have to be paid by the state. Um, the third part, that, that coverage for the claims, it covers defense costs and um, the damages or settlement payment resulting from that claim. Um, on the first party side, or on the third party side as well, you have regulatory cover. So uh, uh, if you get an inquiry from the AG, from the OCR in connection with a health information breach, that is also subject to the regulatory cover. So same thing, there's a retention there as well. You have one retention for all claims. So let's say if there's a breach and you have multiple lawsuits arising and a regulatory yeah. matter, that's it's very, unfortunately that is the norm, that when someone sees someone file suit, lawsuits are public record, you probably are gonna get a copycat. Um, so there would be one retention that's going to apply to all of those, so $100,000 to all of those. Um, and on the regulatory side, you have the coverage, once again, for the attorney's fees and the, the regulatory penalties to the extent that they're insurable. And I do have that caveat because in certain jurisdictions, actually in most jurisdictions, if, if you were to get fined because y there was a real big screw up and they're trying, it's a punitive nature of a fine, or penalty is not necessarily insurable under state law. Uh, the fines that are definitely insurable are the ones where you're trying to fix things, if you're trying to um, reimburse the individuals who are harmed by the <coughs> incident, those types of penalties are definitely insurable under the various laws. Um, the, the regulatory coverage, you know, it's important. And um, I think it's, it, you guys haven't had to deal with that yet, luckily. Um, but it, it's a good thing to have out there. Um, on the first party side <coughs> as well, you have something for business interruption loss. So that would be where your what company, where that not the company, where your website or your systems, your computer systems are shut down. A denial of service attack is a perfect example. We have actually dealt with um, some cities, not here, but in other states where uh, their website was completely shut down, they, had a, they were t attacked, we don't know why. So they couldn't do things where you start thinking, what do you do on the web? Well, sometimes people can file um, appointments to get marriage applications, marriage licenses, all sorts of random things that you start doing. Utility payments. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, tax. Tra track, uh, yeah, taxes. Tax property taxes. They, they couldn't do it. They, couldn't, they were just shut down. Um, and we've had seen bigger ones where their whole computer systems are actually shut down. It's not just their website, and imagine that, that's not fun. So there's business interruption cover 
for that, which covers the revenue losses that you have during that time, as well as the extra expenses that you occur to try to get while you're trying to get up and running. There's a final um, first party cover of data protection loss. So in the event that there is some type of attack or breach and there's not necessarily personal information that's um, taken out, but you lose information. So let's say a whole bunch of records are wiped out or they are, um, they are no longer usable because they have just been corrupted. So you have a cover there in order to try to, to rebuild that information. Um, Christy, that's the digital assets covered by mm -hmm. Sorry, I, yes, exactly. No, I just was, I was, wanted to make sure I was on the mm -hmm. digital And they, um, so each of these coverages, there's, the Mont State has $2 million all together for the year for all of those coverages, for all claims, all losses, all breaches. So the total amount that the state can get is $2 million per year. We'll knock away that you will never need that full amount, um, but that's what it is. Um, and I think in order for the insurance to work properly, I have to emphasize that it's one thing that's really key is notifying the insurer in a timely manner. Which, and which necessitates notifying RMTD in, exactly. a, in a timely manner. And that's, where I, that's why the state has those procedures in place is because what you'll see is that the policy requires notice as soon as possible. And, um, and especially on the breaches, we really want to see that notice right away because what the state has is that your policy limits for pri the breach response costs, the privacy notification costs, double. It goes from 500000 to $1 million if the state uses what we call Beasley nominated service providers. So basically, if you notify the insurer of a breach and the breach says, thank you, why don't you use ABC Fern to do the forensic services? We have these discounted rates we want you to use them. And then if you use them and use the attorney recommended by the insurer and the notice vendors, the policy limits double. So that's a, that's a big increase in the cover. And I think not only do we see that the cover increases, but the rates that the Beasley has, just because of the fact that they have such huge buying power, are much less than yeah. what you're going to get if you called someone on your own and said, hi. We experience what we think might be a breach. How much would you charge to investigate that? Yeah, the idea is, you know, and in a breach, and and the computer forensic firm or the law firm that you're calling out of the blue is going to recognize this. Is you're kind of under the gun. You have to do this. You have to do it under a certain amount of time. There's really not much time for negotiation. Oh, your rate's high. Okay, no, we're going to take another five days to find someone else. Um, uh, there's a, a little bit of potential for gouging in that sense because. People realize that you're you're working under a serious time constraint. This has to be done ASAP, and you know it's it's a lot easier to get a, a better rate if you're a, a law firm or a forensic. And what's nice with Beasley is all these relationships are established, um, and there's a set rate for each of the vendors. So you kind of have this nice contracted out arrangement in advance, and you never have to worry about you know high rates with with a new vendor that you haven't worked with or or a, you know, a new particular case handler or someone that you're, you're not familiar with. Yeah, no, no, oh, and I... So, insurance coverage aside, do you have any numbers for the average amount data breaches cost? Uh, well, if you, if you look at the Ponymon numbers, the ones we looked at earlier, which are a little high, because they, those kind of factor in a bunch of variables that aren't specific maybe to, to public entities, it's about 7.2 million there. I think that's a little high. Uh, but it, it really depends. The, the thing with breaches is it's hard to say without knowing what the characteristics are. And but what, what I mean by that is the type of data elements and um, how many people we're dealing with. Uh, so some of the biggest, for instance, regulatory fines have been for incidents with 100 people or less, but just very sensitive healthcare information, STD information. Um, but other times you have an incident that's Maybe the, the type of data elements involved aren't that sensitive, but there's just so many people. And the front, the, the front end costs, the first party costs become huge. So it's hard to really game a number. It really depends <laughs> on, on what the characteristics of the breach are. And I think one of the things that's interesting I've experienced is that a company, or I know with you, an agency, I've seen when any, 
anyone on the first breach, you're probably going to pay more per record. Yeah, there's a steep it's, learning it's curve. A, there's a real big learning curve because it's not going to be as efficient. You're not necessarily going to know that prices are negotiable when you reach out to the vendors or have the appetite to even try to negotiate them because you're freaked out, um, you know, honestly. Um, so what I, we've seen is that the um, first breach, it's pretty expensive, quite frankly, and then it goes down dramatically. I mean, sometimes buy it in half on the second, third, if they start having um, breaches. <laughs> it can't, definitely I mean, definitely can't, but it's not, I mean, these aren't necessarily the breaches that hit the press, right? It might be 10 records or 150 records, and they're not, they fly under the radar, and those don't usually result in lawsuits. It's just really, you want to make sure you just did the right, you do the right thing and people are happy. Um, and I think the nice thing about the Beasley policy is that because what we've seen, I like to think with the Beasley insurers, is because Beasley's been doing this for so long, I, I like to think that Paul and I, what we can do is really help the insured get past that first hump because you can use our resources and we could try to bring you in help to make sure that the first breach is like, it would be like if it was your fifth or sixth breach because the vendors are out there. We, we've looked at their retention agreements. They're not going to be these crazy mm -hmm. retention agreements that you're afraid to sign and you have to do days of negotiation just to get them on your floor <coughs> working. The rates are already pre-negotiated. Um, and um, so hopefully that's better because you have the benefit if you make use of the Beasley insurance even if it's going to be fully within your retention, I think there's a huge benefit to get the insurer involved, really to get those vendors in place, because you get the benefit even if it's just the retention um, being paid out on it. The other thing with price is that the size of the breach, the size per record, or the cost per record goes dramatically down as the sizes get larger of the breach, because credit monitoring, for example, is much cheaper if you have to buy a million um, subscriptions as opposed to five. Um, same thing, notice costs go down a little bit, not too much because you still have to pay postage, um, but the credit monitoring in particular, the legal fees, once, if you have to do an analysis for over 50 states, it doesn't really change if it's 2 million records or 50 records. So you could see that the legal fees start being cheaper per record too if it's a really huge breach. So, but it's, but it's really, it's all over the map as to costs. I know, it's kind of a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, uh, with the insurance as well, uh, there are, what you will see, unfortunately, it's just the reality of insurance. If there is an incident, you, know, you will notify the insurer, the insurers will get involved, and then there will be a coverage letter. And, we, we, and I, you know, I do have to emphasize is that the coverage letter will always talk about the insuring agreements and try to explain the limits and the retentions for each one. And then there will probably be a reservation of rights <laughs> where they talk about various things that may not be covered. So for example, internal costs on the, if you're gonna do privacy notification costs and responding to a breach, let's say you decide to dedicate your whole IT team to doing the forensic review, that's something that's not gonna be reimbursed under the policy. The policy is only gonna reimburse those third party type costs. Um, so there's there are always gonna be, a, the letters unfortunately end up being a little complicated just because there's lots of insuring agreements and there's little bits and pieces that are not gonna be covered. But I do say, you know, if you do get anything and you're confused, speak with the people in risk management, speak with us. We can definitely walk you through it because the goal is not to make it confusing. It's just that there are a lot of moving pieces here. And we try to be as um, upfront initially as possible to let you know that like internal stuff isn't covered. And you might decide, I don't care. I still want to do it because I have a huge retention and let's do it internally. Or you might make that decision and say, okay, let's use and outside forensic, forensic to do this. And the, the other aspect of notifying, why you wanna notify up to RMTD and have them notify the carrier is, even if the incident is really small, it's not gonna cost a lot of money to respond to. Even if there's really no affirmative confirmation it's a breach or not, you wanna have something on the record in case, you know, six months down the road, a year down the road, you get a lawsuit out of it. So you, you might just be notifying sort of to, to get you know, the benefit of the Beasley vendors and to really sort of preserve your rights in the event that there's a lawsuit later in time. No, that's a very good point. So the policies are what we call claims made and reported policies or, and on the first party side, it's, it's incidents discovered and reported policies. So in order for there to be coverage under the policy, the incident, we don't want to call a breach, <laughs> would have to be discovered during the policy period. 
and reported to the insurer during the policy period, during that same time, in order for coverage to be effective. And the same thing with a claim. So if you have a lawsuit against you, the claim would have to be made against you and reported to the insurer during the policy period. The definition of claim for insurance purposes is broader than just a lawsuit. So if you got a demand letter, even though you think it's crazy and there's no way you're even going to respond, if that demand letter demands money, that's a claim under the policy. That's something that should be reported really in order to preserve your right to coverage under the policy. And what's nice about working with Beasley is you, we, Beasley really encourages you to over-report. Report, report, report. You know, it's not held against you. It's not has nothing to do with the premium setting process. None of that. The idea is we want you. Beasley wants you to report and report and report. If you think something's borderline, you're not sure. Go ahead and report it. It's not anything that will be kind of used against you by anyone. And uh, the insurance coverage is nice. It's all great, but the idea is to focus on breach prevention. That's that's really the focus. And kind of the next uh, <laughs> next slide, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the, the, the name of the game sort of uh, is ATP, so Administrative, Technical, Physical. Those are the three areas we want to think about in terms of having good controls. Um, I, I find that you know, tech and physical are usually the, the easiest two to implement because you, know, you guys are experts on the tech side, you know what you're doing, you can implement that pretty easily. Physical is just about, you know, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a second, it's the administrative process that's most difficult and that really is about training your workforce, um, setting down the institutional knowledge that you have in one place because maybe in your department there's one person that's the, the go-to person in this area and they kind of are the entire source of knowledge and then they leave or they retire or they do something else um, and all that knowledge vanishes. So um, the first step uh, that I think is sort of a necessity and that's a written information security policy or plan. Um, now, Mo Montana state law actually requires state agencies to have a information security plan in place, policy in place. It's not exactly clear that the statute says written, but I, I think it's probably a pretty fair assumption that that's the case. But, but one way or another, this is kind of the, the cardinal document that you'll have that will be distributed to employees when they're hired, when they're separated, um, whatever the, the sort of the dynamic is to, to understand what employees need to do, what the IT folks need to do, kind of how the information is governed, what happens to it. Um, it's, it's a crucial document. It's going to be the first thing that you're going to have to disclose in a regulatory investigation or a lawsuit. It's going to be the first thing that the other side asks for. Show me a copy of your written information security policy plan. What does it say about encryption? Or what does it say about data transfers or so on and so on? So really having that plan in place, um, written down, um, is crucial. I think I, I can't really um, speak about that enough. And you'd be surprised at you know, the amount of organizations that don't really have a, a uniform method in place, a plan in place for dealing with this type of stuff. And I think that and making sure the plan is actually something that people are going to abide by. It's really nice to have something on the books that sounds really fancy and is very secure and it's such a pain in the butt to deal with that no one do, follows the rules. So, it, um, and, we, and we've seen that more often than not where there is a breach and someone says, oh, it's completely against company policy. They shouldn't have done that. And then you look at their policies like, I know why they did that, because your policies are ridiculous. You know, no one is actually following them. And, and so I think you have to make sure that there's a, there's a balance. There's a re diminishing returns at some point of how secure you want to be. And you have to really think about what do you do? What do you want your employees to do? How, what's going to give you the most bang for your buck there? making sure you train everyone in those policies and really enforce them. And log that training. Yeah, and log the training because they will ask for logs. Regulators will ask for logs to make sure that everyone was trained in this when they first were employed and that you have regular refreshment trainings. I think of it as in California, we have lots of sexual harassment training. It's California. Um, and, and, same, and the same thing, but every year you have a training, you, sh you sign that you did the attended the training to have the same information with information. Um, security protocols. Um, and if someone doesn't follow it, to make sure that there is really a slap on the hand. I'm not saying that they need to be fired, but there needs to be at least a, an addressing to the addressing of the issue with them and then maybe a retraining. Something where you're documenting that you're not taking this lightly, that it's not just something in a binder shoved up in the library that you pull out in the event that there is a breach. Yeah, and there's no kind of uniform requirement for what these policies have to say. 
you know, the, it's, it's really up to you to gauge the, the level of risk that's, that you're comfortable with in your organization. But having that set down is, is crucially important. But and things that they should address are, you know, easy things are who should access data? Like who should have, should everyone be able to have the ability to access all data or should you limit people so that they can only access data that they really need to access? Um, how much data can they download to devices? Uh, or if they are going to download it to a device, a portable device, does that device need to be encrypted? I mean, there's a lot of just common sense things. I think it's a really good exercise to even think about. And it can, and it can you can have a uniform policy for everyone or you could have different versions of that policy for different agencies and different entities that you just have to think about what makes sense um, for you. There, that's the beauty of it. So there actually is no right or wrong answer. Um, well, I you guess the wrong it. answer would be not having anything. Right, you just need um, an but, answer. That's right. Yeah, but you, do, but you just need a well thought out solution um, to it. And, and some, some things that certain entities and companies do is they have a layered uh, approach. So maybe employees that are not sort of uh, intimately tied to the data have, you know, they receive a certain policy that covers the basics. And then folks in IT have a broader policy that's more applicable to them. There's sort of depth to each particular person in terms of how they relate to the data. If that's something that's potentially functional for you, think about that. But if not, it's good to still have that one-stop shop plan for everyone to take a look at. And then the final thing with a, a WISP is to make sure that you also make sure that your contractors either have similar policies in place or that they're going to agree to abide by your policies. Right. Even with those California breaches that we talked about, you know, the vendors were, I, I'd like to think it's against California protocol, I don't know, but um, you know, they were doing some stupid things and a lot of breaches do happen because of the vendors, the third party vendors. So I think you want to make sure, think about how your WISP, how it's going to apply to anyone that's outside and that and have a contractual relationship with. And then you want to have the WISP have your response team. So if there is an incident, who are, who's the designated response team? And one thing that I've learned um, in dealing with these matters is to make sure that's not just one person because one person can be on vacation or leave the organization. You usually want to have the response team be at least two people deep in the different departments so that you have person A and then a backup in the event that person A isn't there because breaches happen at inconvenient times and the person that you might be trying to contact may not be available at that point. Definitely, definitely. So that's, I mean, administrative controls really succinctly put, again, the, the number one thing and you know, Montana law is going to require you to have some type of policy so you might as well have a written comprehensive policy that, that everyone can kind of uh, refer to and, and knows that such a policy exists. But uh, the other two sides are the technical and physical controls. So uh, you know, technical, in terms of bang for your buck, um, you know, if you have limited resources, the number one thing is encryption. Uh, if you can implement encryption, particularly for portable devices, um, you're safe in the vast majority of laws across the nation, um, you know, 99%. Um, so if you can really drive that effort and, and get that approved and have your portable devices encrypted, laptops encrypted, Blackberry's encrypted. This really kind of cuts out much of what we've talked about. It's it's a really um, a good way to, to 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 deal with this stuff. Now, it's not always feasible in all different types of organizations. Um, sometimes for technical reasons. Sometimes folks just are uh, mad that they have to deal with encryption on their device. It takes a little longer if they deal with encrypted emails. They don't like to remember a password, so they figure out a way to bypass that just so they can get their work done. Um, having encryption is not the be all end all, but it's a huge thing to have, huge thing to know um, that, that your organization has provided for this with encryption and it smooths out the process quite well. Um, the other things are you know, the, the limits on storage capacity that we talked about, kind of having a sense of what you want to do with your, your portable devices, laptops, whatever, if, if they're more of a communication method or if they're more of, of a data storage method, what they're being used for. Um, there's a ton of good data loss prevention software on the market that can track what folks are doing with information. You know, you give the software a list of variables for the type of information that is sensitive that you, you, know, you don't want XYZ users to um, look at and the software will track hits from whoever's accessing the data. Um, you know, if you have the time and the resources for that, that's another idea. Um, I think good sort of uh, good examples of these standards are the, the NIST standards, which are excellent. 
And uh, the International Standards Organization also has a standard uh, 27002, which is kind of the, the benchmark, I think, as well for information security generally and can give you a really good overview of, of what is state of the art in terms of how you protect the data. Um, uh, PCI, the payment card industry, which is you know, not applicable to you unless you're transacting with credit cards. Um, even if that's not actable, uh, applicable, uh, PCI is a very good framework to really understand data security to see what's kind of um, driving the industry and how things are, are going. So then lastly, we have physical, physical security. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Think about how you physically secure your hardware. And, 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 your, and, and even though the Montana laws don't apply to the paper, think about the paper, too. How are you securing your records? Are, there are lots of computers. I'm not saying bolt down every computer to every desk, but think about how do people have access to those rooms after hours? Are there, are they, is there an alarm system on weekends? I, I was involved in a breach that had a building with backup tapes that were, had lots of health information on them, and they were in a building with alarms, and they thought it was fine. Well, the alarms went off on the weekend, and no one came for 48 hours. Um, so, <laughs> so think about, yeah, I think you have to just have a common sense response and thinking about how are you physically securing things. Um, with your paper as well, uh, you know, is it something that's in an open environment where people can just pull boxes of documents and you'd have no clue um, yeah. that they took it? Yeah, I think, you know, it's one thing to have to notify four million people that their information was compromised because some sophisticated, you know, hacker from overseas uh, compromised the environment. It's another thing to say, oh, someone broke into our office and, and took uh, something. It, it's just, yeah. Just took something over a weekend, and right. then they find out the alarms were going off for that long, and then no one even showed up. It just doesn't bode, it doesn't give you a good feeling. Um, also, the proper purging, Paul touched upon that before, but you know, really purging everything, even your copying machines. I mean, there have been breaches where information is stored on lots of stuff um, your scanners, your copiers, your computers, your laptops. Don't, I think a lot of organizations have a, um, tendency just to leave old equipment in a room and kind of forget about it. it if it's in that room, make sure it's locked at least. Um, but really, I think the ideal, if you have the money, is to make sure that they're properly cleaned. And a lot of that is done through contractors, through third parties. And it's really important to know what they're doing, how they're going to do that, actually. You know, they may have a good reputation. You might have worked with them before. But it's good to figure out what they're actually going to be doing. You know, they may tell you, oh, we'll take care of it. You know, we, we, uh, we've done this a hundred times, but to really figure out what that entails is probably quite valuable. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more on, on Beasley and on working with Beasley. Um, I, I think one of the main values of, of working with Beasley is just the, the institutional knowledge that they've had. They've been ensuring privacy risks for eight, ten years, something like that mm -hmm. now, and have in that time really gathered a lot of excellent information that's available to anyone in the state of Montana that's you know affiliated with the, the insurance program and Christina can kind of talk a little bit about um, the, the no data breach services which is Beasley's uh, way of educating folks to hopefully uh, kind of spread the, the stuff we've talked about here today a little bit and, and get you thinking about this type of stuff and if when you have general questions it's a good resource to refer to. No definitely so the inf you know their login information is all up on the screen and what you'll find on there is there's a newsletter, you can sign up for that to get that. But there's also what I think is really helpful is that they put on webinars quite often. Um, and it'll be either from service providers, so you'll understand more like what are these attorneys' expertise in this area. And it's always kind of nice to know, so if you do start working with them, you've gotten a feel for what they do. Same thing with the forensic vendors. Um, and they also talk about trends. So they might also have something on, let's say a new state passes a new law, they might have a discussion panel on that. Um, they have various sample policies that you can look at, and, um, and there's also sort of all sorts of loss um, prevention information. So take a look at it, click on the things that you think are interesting, and I, and I would encourage to look at it on a regular basis, um, because not on a weekly basis, but maybe you know, every few months, click in there, see what new information's popped up, because there is some really good, entirely free information for you to use and share with your colleagues. Um, and then also to sign up for their data security updates, 
they're interesting. Um, and they're not all just trying to freak you out. They actually are pretty interesting. So I, I would encourage that. They track trends in litigation. They might talk about um, trends in regulatory actions, if there's been a new penalty, whether or not they think it's going to keep on going on for other types of incidents. It's just, it, they're good trends to know about. Yeah, the, the, the reality is, is, you know, law always struggles to keep up with technology. Technology moves a lot faster than law. And so right now we're kind of at a period where the, the technology has accelerated so quickly that the law is just trying to catch up and doing a pretty poor job of it, actually. And so, it, you know, there's a lot of change in this field. And some of the stuff we're talking about today, six months or a year, different. Um, it's just kind of the nature of, of the technological evolution and, and how the law tries to keep up with that. So with that, Great. that's Great. it. And we wanted to open it up to questions. Yeah, we have about 20 minutes left, 15, 20 minutes left. So we, we definitely want to take some questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, two. Of course. <coughs> On uh, the exposure <coughs> slide, you mentioned the direct data breach. Uh, costs and I was just what you, what have you guys experienced for non-direct breach costs such as well I guess loss of revenue would be one but for states it's the, basically the public perception of a data breach and it seems like common the common way that they feel to resolve it is just to basically can all management you know and they said that fixes it you know it's management's fault because of this data's breach and then of course the litigation they pay have you seen any public perception changes on how they view uh, basic public sector breaches? Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely a, a reputational element that takes a big hit. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Usually the response is uh, a lot of folks get fired and, and then some time goes by and kind of the, the trust rebuilds again. But it, it's definitely um, it's something that has a, a serious reputational impact. Um, folks really think of when they entrust their information to, to state, local agencies, they're assuming almost a higher level of protection than they do in the private sector. You know, if, if my breach gets compromised because I'm playing video games with Sony and Sony messed something up, you know, okay, it's Sony, whatever. Um, but if it's the state tax department or, you know, the, the, the state registry of marital records or something like that, I, I, folks are almost more alarmed. So I, I think there's more of a reputational component for public sector breaches at times because people have that initial groundwork where they think that state agencies are, are holding this information as securely as possible. And a lot of people have a impression that there's a higher standard for public agencies than there would be for a, a private company, which is not the case. I mean, they're, they're usually about the same, but that's the perception. And when these incidents happen, we definitely get a lot of um, alarm. I don't know if there's been any studies to put like a number to that, but you know, have have a dollar amount fixed to that. But it's it's definitely a factor. But investigative journalist articles where they do like the exposés and stuff after that, I think would be much more common for a state yeah. agency because there's lawyer requests. You know, a, a private entity doesn't have to really necessarily tell you whatever it wants to tell. It doesn't have to tell you answer your question. But a good um, journalist will, will resort to Freedom of Information Act request. Will try to pull as much information that you're obligated to give them out of the, the agency in the first place and we'll kind of run with that. So there's definitely, it's easier to build that type of damaging article against a public agency because they, they have to play ball. You know, if you, if you ask them questions, by and large, they, they can't ignore them. They have to answer them. You made me think of another question. But anyway, uh, I'll ask a second. Can I ask question, question? Which is my new question. As in the legal department, one thing we've asked is when we evaluate our own security posture, we're creating our own security plan and we're evaluating our controls on our systems. Um, how is that subject to FOIA? Um, and you know, can that be requested? It may be. Basically a report of right. how our security is in terms it, it, it most certainly may be. And um, you know, I think uh, an enterprising plaintiff's attorney would definitely take that approach. Um, you know, you'd go straight to FOIA, get as much of the um, correspondence exchange that went into the, the planning of those uh, policies and you know maybe there's a series of communications where one person saying we don't need that we do need this we don't need that we do need this that would you know all be potentially um, discoverable and so it's definitely something to think of I mean there may be ways to cloak all that in, in privilege but maybe not so yeah it's you definitely something. You guys uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and my last question was about the Beasley uh, cyber liability insurance. So as you know that we are more heavily under scrutiny of federal regulations and what they will do is evaluate our security posture uh, to determine whether or not we get information. 
uh, or whether we're uh, not basically secure enough internally to where we're privileged with their information and can disseminate their information. You see the insurance companies doing the same thing to public sectors by determining their rates and being able to come in and say, we want to evaluate your secure security posture as a state agency or a local government agency before we determine your rates. Because um, right now it's yeah. probably pretty standard what the rates are, but in the future we can probably argue that there's going to be more breaches in the future regardless of more Definitely. And I was just curious if it be follow the same course as medical to where it depends on your past history but also your current conditions determines your rate. Yeah, no, I think on the, um, with the insurance, when they do it on an individual basis, so you're part, Montana's a part of a program. So I think it, they, it, there's a lot of members in that program. Um, there's, there's something like five, so 600 I, I think, yeah, I, so I think for it's almost an impossibility to really do that in-depth of an analysis. Can I just add a little bit? Because mm -hmm. I think it's a really good question. And, you know, she mentioned that we belong to a national program because the state has its property insurance with, um, Alliant, who's the broker, the insurance agent, we get the free coverage for the cyber. So we belong to a national program, and they really don't do individual underwriting where they're asking us rate questions because it's pretty much free. But what we can tell you is that we looked at a, an excess program, a layer of insurance above this program, to kind of see what it might cost with a company called Liberty. Mm -hmm. which I think is also no, Liberty, uh, yeah, uh, London, yep. Yeah. And you're exactly right. They, we had to fill out questionnaires, 10 or 12 page questions. Yeah, it, the underwriting yeah. process. It's not uncommon. So the privacy officers yeah. and we had losses and what kind of protocol and security guidelines we had in the place. So you hit it right on the head. It was very important to them to know what we were doing before they would agree to. Yeah, in a, st in a standalone program, I mean, it, through the underwriting process, that would all be addressed. Yeah. The underwriter want to look at your past history, uh, kind of your your pre-existing conditions, if you want to make the medical analogy. Um, what you're doing, what your data controls look like, what type of information you work with, how many employees, all that type of stuff. And the, the, and the questionnaires are interesting. Like if you saw them, it's really interesting to see what they ask about. Um, so yeah, they, they will do some really detailed it's not evaluations. Different. It's not different yeah. A lot. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I was reading about the South Carolina breach and one of the, I think some of the information technology sent us the article on that this morning that the forensic investigation was conducted by Mandiant, mm -hmm. a company called Mandiant, and there's now a discovery request from the press, and there's a dispute about whether the forensics, because of you know, how the breach occurred, yeah. and I don't know that we'd, we'd want to tell people how the breach occurred. So, have you, have you had experience with that? Uh, oddly enough, in that lawsuit, there's, there's another forensic vendor, Trustwave, and Trustwave has just been added to the lawsuit. The lawsuit was originally against the state of South Carolina. Trustwave's been added, um, I'm not exactly sure the reason, but, just because you don't have a reason doesn't mean you can't sue someone is, is kind of the, the way this stuff works. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's not uncommon. And I, I think, um, you know, Mandiant has a great reputation, so does Trustwave. They're all, they're all excellent. Uh, but you know, a good plaintiff's attorney sees a salivating, a good target there, and he's going to latch on to that. That's probably the reason for that in the first place. Will that be, will that be like a presidential case? There's not a lot of that out there. And it seems kind of tricky because, again, how it happened is sort of you know, Especially the press well, the thing is that in terms of precedent, you, and that's a great point, most companies, entities, are afraid to get to the point where they could set precedent. They, they cave early. It's just not worth the risk. You know, maybe we'll win, good, percent, good percentage will win, but 25% chance we'll lose. And if we lose, you know, we're talking catastrophic, catastrophic damages, you know, 50, 100 million dollars more. Um, most entities just don't have that appetite for risk, so they'll just cave. And that's the problem with, uh, from a legal perspective with these cases is no one's really ventured to take one to trial yet. No one's said, okay, we're going to put our foot down. Not a single one has even gone past motion for summary judgment. People cave it's a, People have really, what you'll see is that they'll file an initial pleading. It's called a motion to dismiss. Try to get the complaint knocked out. They, some, some states you win, California you lose. <laughs> well, most states you lose. The complaint gets to go on. And then you do some discovery, and, and honestly, you'll see the next motion where the, the, the company that experienced a breach, the defendant, will file something saying, this is why we are not liable, and you were saying that we did all these things wrong, and you're wrong. You know, we, might, we were a victim here, or we're a victim of a crime, and we have no liability, and we shouldn't pay anything, and they file it, and it looks really great, and there's a hearing set on court date, and then it settles. I mean, almost always, we, I've never seen one even, or maybe they argue it in the court hearing, 
but they settle before there's an opinion from the court because it is way too scary for those companies or for the state or for any agency to deal with that type of loss. I mean, I think the only way you're going to get precedent setting is if you have a small enough breach, so it's a thousand people or something like that where they could say, okay, so if we lose, we owe you know, $150,000 max. And, then that, and that's something that's within the risk appetite. But when you're dealing with these breaches of m more than a million people, it's just the risk appetite is not there. Do you have any advice for dealing with law enforcement? I mean, when there's a breach, we tell people to report to escalate it to RMTD, and we work with, with you folks, with the attorneys for Beasley. What I've, what I've heard in some of those breaches is that people have contacted law enforcement, and sometimes they'll confiscate the portable device, yeah. all the stuff, and you won't see it for months, so you can't notify. Mm -hmm. there, there, yeah, there's, there's pros and cons to dealing with law enforcement, I find. You it. have all that, don't you? We should work with you on that. Definitely, definitely. So if you go through the carrier, um, you know, hopefully we'll get outside privacy counsel involved. And counsel can direct that relationship with law enforcement. And a lot of the attorneys that Beasley uses, ha you know, they have very good relationships with the field offices, the FBI field offices. That's not at all uncommon, you know, what you just described. FBI will arrive on site, they'll take the device, and then you don't hear from them for months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, what you can hope for then, or what you should hope for, is that you get a written stay on the notification because then you have a hold in place and you don't need to notify anyone. Um, but what happens a lot of times is, you know, folks will get that hold from the FBI. They'll say, okay, well, the FBI is doing the forensic work. The FBI told us not to notify it. Let's just sit tight and forget about it. Or, you know, we'll just wait. And then they hear from the FBI nine months later, eight months later, half the people working in the organization might have left already. The FBI says, okay, you know, this is what we found. Notify all these 50,000 people and do it right now. Um, and people are kind of stuck at that point. So uh, just because the FBI has taken the investigation over doesn't mean that you kind of stop what you're doing and wait to hear from them. You should definitely be moving forward with the investigation. Now, it, you know, if you have a limit to that in terms of the device is no longer in your possession, you, know, you, you might not be able to do much, but you, you could definitely copy the device. No, 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 no. Usually, usually you'd make a copy of the device before the FBI arrived on site. I mean, they're not. That might be important to do that before you turn it over. Most certainly. You might not see it again. Most certainly, most certainly, yeah. The FBI is nice because you get free forensic work. <laughs> um, so instead of going out and paying on the open market to have a forensic firm come in, very expensive. You know, the FBI will do that stuff for free. But the, the converse of that is they start to really take over the investigation. And when they feel like their part is done and you should be notifying, they tell you to notify right away. And then if you need another 30 or 45 days from that point to get the whole notification effort in gear, that's going to look really bad when those letters come out and you know, you're talking about an incident that happened a year and a half ago. Great, great. Any, any other questions we can answer? Anything at all? Yeah, of course. So I'm aware of, of real punitive situations involving HIPAA and uh, laws like that. But with the state breach notification laws, do you guys have any examples, anything I can use, of specific cases where agencies or even companies, private companies under <coughs> states that cover that, uh, where there's, there have been actions taken against those companies for failure to report data breaches? Yes. Uh, the, the, the state that kind of leads the way is Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts has fined um, probably a, about 15 folks now under their state data breach notification law. Um, they have um, done that through, usually through the courts. They've, they've kind of uh, instigated an action under the courts and have fined folks for improper privacy controls, for failure to notify people in a timely manner. Uh, Massachusetts is very much the standard. There's a, um, I think they've had at least five actions over the past year where that's been an issue. Um, yeah. So not, not every state law has a, a punitive damage component to it. Um, so, for instance, in South Carolina, there's a $1,000 a, a person, nominal damages, which is why that lawsuit was so appetizing, because 3.6 million people, $1,000 a person, it's a lot of money. Um, Montana doesn't have that, you know, dollar amount component built into the statute, but that's not to say that that's any kind of, uh, that that's going to dissuade anyone from filing a lawsuit. Because even though there might not be a right of action under that particular statute we talked about earlier, you know, if you're, if you're a clever plaintiff's attorney, you know, you can figure out a whole other list of theories to bring it under. Emotional distress, what have you. You don't need to necessarily have a statute to rely on. 
because uh, most folks just have a built-in expectation of privacy to some extent. And if something runs afoul of that, it's just juicy and it's, it's, a, it's easy to build a case from there. Excellent, excellent. Any other questions we can answer? All, All right. right, well, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us again. And uh, you know, we're, we're gonna stick around here. If anyone has any questions they wanna talk about person to person, we're happy to take those too. And thank you so much.